Let's hear from the Lord this morning. What do you say? Hopefully that's what you're here for. I'll give this recording a good place to start. Good morning. Welcome to Anchor Church. I'm glad that you're here, whether you're in the room or whether you're on the other side of this camera that I have become strangely comfortable with. <laughs> I didn't think I would ever say that. It only took three years and change for me to get comfortable with the fact that we have people we're talking to online that we may never see in person. If you can be here in the building, please come join us. If you're near enough to Granite Falls, North Carolina, and you can come be part of what we're doing, we would welcome you. We would love you. You would fit in just fine. I'm fairly certain because... Uh, we're such a diverse crowd that it would be tough not to find somebody that has the same kind of weird that you think you've got. So if you can join us, it would be great. There's so much that happens in the room that just doesn't translate. But if you're only able to join us here this way, I'm glad that you do because it's a privilege to minister to you in the way that you allow us to be in your life. This morning, the Lord has a message for us. It comes out of Galatians chapter 2. We're going to read verses 18 through 20. And as usual, I've got more scripture than that that we'll get to as we go through, but Galatians chapter 2, 18 through 20 is our reference text this morning. You probably will recognize this. I feel like I say that a lot, and I, I, hope, I hope I'm not taking for granted that you're reading your Bible and have spent time in the Word prior to joining us on Sunday morning. If you have not, this may be a difficult message for you today. Galatians chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. If you give your notes titles, if you're one of those people, this message is entitled Identified or Interested. Identified or Interested. Let's begin reading. Galatians 2, verse 18. Paul is writing and he says, If I rebuild the system I tore down, I show myself to be a lawbreaker. For through the law I have died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer once again this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful that it is alive, that it is active and that you use it again and again in our lives. I thank you for your faithfulness to speak to us through it in every situation, if we'll just give you the opportunity. Today, we offer ourselves here to receive from you. Lord, we're here to hear what you have to say to us. We welcome the opportunity for what you want to invest in us today. I pray, Lord, that your spirit has prepared the hearts of those you've gathered. And I, prepare if they, or I pray that if they weren't prepared before they got here, that you prepare them quickly to hear and receive what you have in mind today. Let me speak well and speak clearly for the purpose of your kingdom, and let us leave here changed for having been in your presence. In your name we pray. Amen. So Paul writes this passage, and that last portion of it you've probably heard. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. But these surrounding verses bring a bigger picture and a great deal more weight than just that verse. That verse alone is tremendous. Any verse we read out of Scripture is tremendous, but context means everything. This morning I want to look at this entire passage in the context of our identity in Christ. Because the truth of the matter is we are called to identify ourselves with Christ, not simply to express an interest in the things that God has done. We are called to identify ourselves with Him. Not just to walk by like casual spectators and say, that's interesting what you did there. I like what you've done with the place. This is some good work. I think I'll hang around and see what I can learn. There's a difference in being interested and being identified. The difference between a religious person and a disciple of Christ is their participation in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What do you mean participation? I don't mean nail yourself to this. Please don't do that. That's not what I'm asking you for. I don't think the Lord is glorified in that way. We're talking spiritually about what has to happen to the person that I was before I met Christ and said, I believe, I repent, and I will follow you. The person that I was and the motivations of that person are gone, and I am now identified with what happened here because my identity is a man who has been crucified and dead because that is spiritually what he deserved, and Christ took my place and did that for me. The consequence of my sin is here. And therefore, just as surely as the body of Christ died 
and was laid in a grave and became resurrected as something completely new and different, so must I be. Am I identified with Christ or am I just watching the spectacle of church and Christianity from a distance saying, that's interesting, that's pretty cool, that looks fun? Am I just partaking of the bits and pieces of it that look interesting and fun? Am I trying to incorporate them into my life or have I wholly identified myself with this? Has it changed me? There are a lot of people that claim to believe in him and a lot of people that show up to church and a lot of people that read their Bible every day and a lot of people that will brag to you about how much they pray. And there are a lot of people who will agree in principle with what this book says. There's some good stuff in there, but those people still remain unchanged in the way that eternally matters because their spirit is still what's driving their decisions. I've read this and there's some good stuff in here. I'm going to try to apply this to my life. No. That's not how this works. I don't get to apply this to what's already happening with me. Who I am and what I am has got to become identified with Christ, which means it's dead, and this is replacing what I was, not adding to who I am. It's a huge difference. There's a lot of people that call themselves Christians, and they're simply interested in the good ideas and the good principles of Jesus' teaching. But they stop short when they get asked to deny themselves in any way. Deny myself? What do you mean? You, there's things I can't do. There's rules. There's, uh, there, there are things I shouldn't partake in, but I want them, and they, they're craving. I was born like this, and I should get to pursue. Who God wouldn't make me like this if I didn't. We're going to address some of that today. Identifying with Christ is not just being a spectator who enjoys some of the benefits of this and appreciates them from a distance. There's a lot of church people and a lot of religious people and a lot of spiritual people that want to incorporate as much of their selves into their faith as possible or they even do a worse thing and they simply try to incorporate some, some spiritual ideas into who they are. And they become polluted and they are, in fact, those people that are seeking to how much of me can I still be and do this? How much of that can I add to what I'm doing? What's enough that makes me a Christian? and still comfortable in my skin. Such people are not identified with Christ because they have yet to sign their own death certificate. Such people are not identified with Christ. Lord, help me. This is hard to say because it forces me to look at my own life and look at places where I've, I've said, okay, that, that looked like a good idea. I thought I would try that, but I didn't give myself wholly and completely to it. I didn't commit. I didn't see it through. I wasn't willing to take me all the way here. I just wanted to take that with me in the suitcase I was carrying. If we're simply interested with Christ, we're not identified with him because we've yet to die to ourselves. Being interested in the work of God does not identify us with it in the way that matters. Verse 18 is where Paul begins to address this, and that's why I want to look at the surrounding verses, not just the one that we all know. Paul says, if I rebuild the system I tore down, I show myself to be a lawbreaker. What does that mean, rebuild the system I tore down? We can't decide to behave and be judged by an old version of the law simply because we prefer it. When the law changes, there are some things that used to be legal that now become lawless. Let's just make this really practical. If you live here in Granite Falls and you're headed down Dudley Shoals Road, like out toward Taylorsville, there's a little intersection there by the Domino's and the gas station. And we used to just fly through that thing, headed down the hill and around the corner. Because the speed limit there, it's gone from 25 to 35 to 45, and you know around the curve it's 55, and none of you drove 45 through that intersection. You're accelerating toward the 55 that you know is coming up. And I've done that for the whole time I have lived here. In fact, I drive that road at least twice a day taking the kids to and from school. You know where I'm talking about. If you live around here, if you don't, just bear with me. It'll make sense. There is now at that intersection by the Domino's Pizza and the gas station about 97 orange flags and at least 60 new signs that say new traffic pattern and you get there and there's a stop sign at that intersection that did not used to exist. 
There is a new law at that intersection on Dudley Shoals Road. And if I behave by the old law that says once I go past that little daycare, I can accelerate from 25 to 35 to 45, and I can blow through that intersection at 55, and there won't be any problems. If I do that today, even though that has been okay and perfectly right and not been a problem for the five years I've been here and for Lord only knows how many years before I moved into town, if I do that today... What I was doing even a few weeks ago is now illegal and will get me a ticket. And if I do it at the rate that I'm describing, there's a good chance I would take my license from me. Why? I just prefer the old law. I'm still keeping the law. It's just the version of it that appealed most to me. I don't like to stop and slow down. I got somewhere to be, and I'm going to get there, and this is in my way. So I'm just saying I'm going to live according to the old law. How far will that get me with the officer that stops me before I make it to the church there at the bottom of the hill? I'm going to venture a guess and say not very because I can't live according to an old law. I don't get to pick the old law just because it's more convenient for me. What was once legal is now lawlessness. If I rebuild the system I tore down, I show myself to be, be a lawbreaker. When the law changes, what was once permissible is now sin. When my life changes, what was once permissible is now not profitable for me. Paul's talking here about this same concept that I'm describing to you because he's referring to the fact that there was once a law under the old covenant before the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There was a law then where we were justified by our behavior. We made mistakes, and then we went to the altar, and we prayed, and we offered our sacrifices, and the Lord accepted them, and we were good until we screwed up again, which was longer for some people than others. I was one of the others. Still am most days. Doesn't take very long for me to screw up again. We call that the Old Covenant. This idea of being interested in Christ that we're talking about today is that I would look at the things Christ is doing and I think I could apply them to my life and I can just live according to these principles and I'm good to go. But that idea that my behavior and me just doing my best to be like God wants me to be will get me there no longer exists. It's an old law. It might appeal to me because it makes it easier. I'm going to follow these laws and rules that I like. But the old law doesn't exist at all. The way of being justified by my behavior no longer exists. That's the old way of doing things. Paul says that's the system that was torn down. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ established a completely, gnaw, a completely new law and a standard that removes us from the equation. It's not my behavior or anything I say or anything I do. Now we function under grace. It is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that makes me able to stand before a holy God. So there's an understanding I have now that apart from the sacrifice of Christ, I can't be good, I can't be holy, I can't be righteous. The law has changed. I can't produce a life that's pleasing to God by how I behave. I have to go to the cross. I've got to identify with him and die with him. Not just look at the rules and the laws that interest me and try to incorporate them into my life. The old law is dead, and if I try to go back to that system that was torn down, I am now a lawbreaker. <clears throat> Verse 19, Paul continues, he says, For through the law I have died to the law so that I might live for God. The new law of grace requires me to identify with Christ. I don't have an option. I don't get to choose whether I want to go to the cross and die. Unless I simply want to choose that I won't be a Christian. I won't be a disciple of Christ. That's my choice. I've got to. Take who I was, and I've got to take what I prefer, and what I like, and what I crave, and what I'd rather be doing, and it's got to die, it's got to be put to death, it's got to be put all the way in last place and buried in the ground as if it was never there, if I want to be alive again with him the way he was when he was resurrected. Anything less than that is lawlessness. The Bible speaks a great deal about lawlessness. 1 John 3, 4 says it the most clearly of anywhere. It just straight up says lawlessness is sin, period. That's the end of that. 
Any questions? Shouldn't be. Simple declarative sentence. Lawlessness is also translated in, in Scripture as iniquity. You might have heard that word. It's a great King James word. It comes from a Greek word. It means the same thing as lawless. The place where you've probably heard it the most, though, is in, math, in, a, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 23. Jesus says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, you workers of evil, those of you who sin. Identifying with Christ means that we have submitted to this new law of grace, the new covenant that he established on the cross, and the only way we can do so, the only way we can participate in it is to participate in his death on the cross. I've got to identify with him in his death and his resurrection. See, we arrive at the place of receiving the grace of God only when we allow the spirit that we used to identify ourselves with to die. I used to be a person who did those things, who liked those things, who wanted those things, and who engaged in them when that came up. That's an important thing. I used to like and I used to want and I used to identify with and I would give in and do them when they presented themselves. I had a conversation. I've had multiple conversations with people recently. And I was a little surprised to learn how many people think that temptation is sin. Or that continuing to crave or want something that I used to want in and of itself is sin. The indulging in it is what's sin. But Jesus was tempted in the desert. If temptation were sin, Jesus would have been in sin and he would have been imperfect. Because he was tempted three times. He was tempted in a way that represents every sin that we will ever face. Every temptation we will ever see is represented in those three things. That's a whole different teaching this morning. But Jesus himself was tempted. Temptation is not sin. And sometimes we get set up for failure with these huge testimonies that people come up and give. Well, I was strung out on so many drugs, and I just instantly became sober, and I never, claimed, never craved one again. That's a tremendous story, but that's the exception, not the rule. I used to identify with a certain lifestyle. I used to crave doing certain behaviors that are not pleasing to the Lord. But I haven't again a single time since I stepped into the grace and wonderful, wonderful mercy of his presence and his forgiveness. Well, that's awesome. But that is not the case for most people. The difference is, if I'm identified with Christ, I'm not indulging in those things when those temptations come up. I put them to death over and over and over, and I will deny myself the opportunity to pursue them even if I still crave them and want them. Identifying with Christ, we're submitted to a new law. We only get to identify when we're there with him. True disciples of Christ will deny themselves the opportunity to return to what they once knew. If we've given ourselves permission to return to what we used to do, then we've not yet denied ourselves anything and we aren't following Christ. If I'm not willing to deny what my flesh craves and wants and what I would rather and what I'd prefer, and here's the hard thing. If we call ourselves Christians, we want to relegate those things to, well, I don't, you know, craving drugs or wanting to go get drunk or wanting to be in a same-sex relationship or wanting to do, tick off whatever your big ticket sin might happen to be. You shouldn't want and crave those things and those are wickedness, but what if I just personally would like to lay in bed for an extra 30 minutes rather than reading my Bible? That is a temptation of my flesh to do what pleases me best rather than do what God's asked me to do. Deny yourself. Maybe you should learn to get up early. Well, I don't want to get up earlier. Well, maybe the reason you can't get up earlier is because you won't go to bed earlier. Well, if I don't go to bed earlier, then I've got no time to do these things that I do at night. Deny yourself. At some point, what God wants has to be more important than what makes you comfortable. At some point, what God wants has to be your priority. And you have to make it so. Die to yourself. If you give yourself permission to go back to those things, if you give yourself permission to leave God out or ignore what God's asked, you're not identified with him yet. You haven't denied yourself anything. There's no cost. Mark 8, 34 and 35, Jesus is speaking. He says, it says, summoning the crowd along with his disciples. Keep that in the back of your mind. We'll get there in a minute. Summoning the crowd along with his disciples. He said to them, if anyone wants to be my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. Jesus said, deny yourself 
and carry this thing around with you so that whatever raises itself up against the knowledge of me and the desires that I've given you and the will that I have for you so you can conveniently and quickly put to death and identify with me that thing that would keep you from where I am. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Jesus did not call us to model godly ideas with worldly principles. People that are interested in Christ would look at this and say, oh, that taking care of the poor, that's a good idea. I think I will model Christ by taking care of the poor. I will do it with my money in the way that I see fit, and I will call myself a great Christian because I've done a good Christian thing. He didn't say, Take some godly ideas and model them with your worldly stuff. He said, model godly principles in the midst of your worldly circumstances. Deny yourself and do what I want rather than what you want. And he addresses that idea to the crowd. Who's the crowd? That's everybody. That's not the monks, that's not the priests, that's not just the preachers and the teachers and the worship leaders and the people that want to get online and call themselves great religious people. He talked to the crowd, everybody that showed up. If you've been paying attention on the Wednesday night series we've been teaching on the parables of Jesus, you'll notice there are times when Jesus speaks to the whole crowd and when the crowd is there, there's a group of people who have come because they're just interested in the celebrity of Jesus He's gotten kind of famous. People want to see what he has to say. There's people that are actually interested in his teaching. There's people that just saw there was a crowd and want to know what's up. There are Pharisees that believe he's the son of God, and there are Pharisees who say they want to discredit him because he's a blasphemer, and there are Pharisees that just want to destroy him because he realized, they realize that Jesus will destroy their way of life. He's got the disciples there, some of whom, through some of these parables that he's teaching and through through a portion of the ministry of Jesus, some of the disciples have still not even confessed him as Lord yet. They're simply following him because they're drawn by whatever it is spiritually that he carries with him. It's fascinating to consider. When Jesus addresses the crowd, there's not a single place you can be in your life that he's not talking to you if you can hear him. Whether you are saved, unsaved, on the fence, deconstructing, religious, Wherever you're at, if you hear the word of God, he's speaking to you. He addresses it to the crowd, and he says, deny yourself. He addresses the crowd, and he says, if you want to follow me, this is what the cost is. This is where the church has fallen down terribly. This is where Christians who just want to love on people, this is where evangelists sometimes come up short because they want to get the conversion prayer at the altar. But we have to present the whole gospel Honestly, Jesus said, here's what it's going to cost you. Deny yourself and keep ready all of the instruments necessary to do it over and over and over and over and over every day of your life as things come up. I don't want to lie to you. I'm going to be honest. Deny yourself. This is what the gospel is about. Jesus was honest with people and he addressed that to the entire crowd. He did not say, take these godly ideas And model them with your life. He said, model these godly principles by putting your life to death. He addresses the crowd. Not ministers, not fanatics, not people on the fringes. Anybody that hears it. There's a lot of people that gather to hear the things that Christ might want to say. And they read this and they're interested. And interest is free. But identity costs you something. Identification with Christ is costly. And even as Christians, we're guilty of focusing on the cost. We want to look at big billboard costs like, oh, people may persecute me for what I believe. Oh, I might have to dedicate a big chunk of my time to going to church. I might have to give up some great sin that I like. We can't ignore, though, You know, we get the big things, big costs, but we can't ignore the small personal things that we're also being asked to deny because the life of a Christian is one of constant and consistent denial. The life of someone who follows Christ is the life of someone who is constantly being confronted with something they would rather do and having to choose Christ over that thing. We might, Lord, help me. It's a tough message. We get really small in our thinking. We think really, really big, or we think really, really small, and we leave the practical out so often when we teach but, and when, when we preach. 
we live a daily life. And you've probably, even as I've said that, that statement, oh, daily you're going to have to deny yourself some things. You've probably even begun to tick off some things. The Spirit of God is already working in your heart to try and make you think and realize some of those things I should probably deny, deny myself. These are pleasures that the Lord has not afforded me, that I've simply incorporated and hoped I can still say, say, stay saved and do them. I'm just going to tell this story. Lord, help me. Did a question and answer session when I was at the high school functioning as a chaplain this week. We got to the end of a long apologetic series. I've been teaching them a basically a college-level apologetics course for the past eight weeks. And I do a question and answer at the end. And I had one young lady who literally, she was brokenhearted as she asked this question. It's shocking what children will say. She was sitting right on the front row in the chapel at the high school. And out of all the things that we've discussed, the thing that she asks me is about some activity she'd been involved in when she was younger. And she began to break down in tears and say, when I love the Lord and I want to do what he wants me to do, but when will my, when will my cravings and my desire for that to go away, when will it stop? When will it ever quit? And I had to look at that young lady because I love her and I feel the way that God loves her and I had to be honest and say, dear, they might not. You might have to deny yourself that over and over. And I know how hard that can be because I have things in my own life that I have prayed and I have begged and I have sought the Lord and said, please make this go away. The Apostle Paul that's writing the passage we're studying from this morning says, I've got this thorn in my flesh and God won't take it away. There's something that keeps coming up. The reality is when I say, oh, identify yourself with Christ and deny yourself and take up your cross. When, when Jesus says these things, when Paul says these things, and I'm just repeating them to you this morning out of Scripture, the reality is we may never be free of the cravings and desires of our flesh. There are some things that we have invited into our life. There are some things we have participated in that have conditioned our flesh to like them, and we may continue to like them and crave them and want them until the day that we die. As long as we live in this body, those things may never go away because our body wants what we've trained it to enjoy up to this point. And God is no less real. And your faith is no less real. The God of all the universe is no less powerful, powerful or able to save you and no less powerful or present in your life simply because of that fact. Me continuing to struggle with the same thing and having to deny myself repeatedly does not mean that God does not care and God is not there and I'm not saved. Sometimes we've just allowed ourselves to partake in things that our body likes. Drugs, sexuality, spiritual forces that we began to play around with that we enjoyed the power and influence they gave us. We might not ever stop craving those things. We may have to deny ourselves again and again for the rest of our lives in order to identify with him. But I believe he gives us the strength to do that. Otherwise, he would not have instructed us to. When Jesus says deny yourself, that's the practical, everyday, real world, hard truth of what he means. Deny yourself and take up your cross. I know there are some things you'd rather be doing. But I need you to glorify me and honor me. When you said you repent, when you said you believe, and I said follow me, Anyone who wants to follow me has to identify with my death and my resurrection. When those personal, de when those personal desires begin to present themselves, Christ gives us the power to deny them. Having them in my life may not ever go away, but that doesn't mean I'm in sin. I don't give in to them. Interested people will see how much of that I can still incorporate into my life. People who are identified with Christ will be empowered by him to keep following him because we participated in his death. Identifying with Christ will cost you. It's a sacrifice. It comes at a price, but any price for the grace of God is worth it in the scope of eternity. Second Samuel twenty four twenty four. 
is the conclusion of a story where King David is called to go build an offer, altar and offer some sacrifices somewhere. And when David approaches the man who owns the land in the area where he says the Lord has sent me to sacrifice and to praise and to worship him, the man says, I understand why you're doing this. Let me give it to you. I'll let you have it for free because of the great purpose that you want to accomplish with it. In 2 Samuel 24, 24, David responds and says, no. I insist on buying this from you for a price. I will not offer my God any offering that doesn't cost me anything. And so David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 20 ounces of silver. David said, the Lord has told me to follow him and to be obedient. And if it doesn't cost me anything, it doesn't reflect anything of value. And so David pays for it, and he pays for it with 20 pieces of silver. Now, silver is an interesting thing to pay with. Silver was extremely valuable then. In fact, in some periods in history and in this part of the world, silver was more rare than gold. Not more valuable, but just more rare. It, had, it did have tremendous value, though, not just because it was rare, but because people recognized back then things like silver and gold and precious jewels, they recognized them for two things. Number one, they realized they were recognized by, or they were created by God. We can't make silver. We can't make gold. We can't make precious jewels. We have to find them in the earth that God created. And then we have to use them in a way that is worthy of how beautiful they are. The second thing that was intri- interesting, apart from the fact that they're made by God and rare and beautiful, The second thing that's interesting is that it's impervious to fire. Almost everything that was known in the world at the time, fire could destroy it. But precious jewels and silver and gold, when you get them hot, when you throw them into the hottest furnace that we can come up with, they may change form, but they don't burn away. They're not destroyed. In fact, when you take something like silver or gold and you heat it, it becomes more pure than it was. The impurities rise to the surface and can be removed, so all you have left is the purest version of that material. Our soul is the same. It was made by God. It is unique in every possible way. It's beautiful to behold, and it can be molded into nearly any shape by my cravings and my desires or by my willingness to follow after the Lord and let his spirit do the work. And when it gets subjected to fire, the impurities become obvious. When we face difficulty and hardship, when I'm given the choice to either deny myself or give in, the impurities surface. This is what I'm struggling with. This is what's happening inside of me becomes very visible, what am I going to do? When you're in recovery programs, there's this thing called HALT, H-A-L-T. You're more than likely going to struggle with relapse if you are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. H-A-L-T. That's the truth in your life, no matter whether you've got an addiction issue or whether you're just dealing with sin in general. If I am hungry, I mean, there's an entire commercial campaign. Snickers candy bars. You're not you when you're hungry hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. If I'm in one of those positions, I don't need to make a decision. I need to chill out. I need to back away from the circumstances because the odds are I'm going to make a terrible decision right now. When I find myself in a difficult place and I'm lacking something, when I'm offered the opportunity, what am I going to choose? I need the power of God. I've got to be identified with Christ Because the impurities surface when things get difficult, when you heat things up, when I'm faced with a hard choice. But when we offer back to God what he made that can't be destroyed, the impurities get exposed and God can remove us from them. And I don't mean that it permanently goes away. Sometimes it does, but more often than not, God just takes the purity and he says, okay, you've brought, (laughs) Lord, help me with this picture. You've brought your corpse back to the foot of the cross. I know you've died to this before, but it's trying to wake up. 
We want to bring the pretty, beautiful thing to the Lord. God, here's all that I am, and this corpse just doesn't want to die. And we bring it back to the foot of the cross. And in the midst of that heat and difficulty, if we'll bring everything, the beautiful and the ugly, right there before him, he'll separate the two so that we can deny this and we can pursue this. That's identifying with Christ. We deny ourselves and we place our impurities at the foot of the cross. And that's the only way that we're ever going to be refined enough to present ourselves before a holy God. Not by my works, not by my behavior, not by something I've done that makes me pure and holy enough. By bringing everything before him and letting him heat it up and separate it so that I can have the power to deny what I don't want in me. We're called to identify with a God who is deliberately and entirely separate from wickedness. He's working to redeem and refine and reach those that are wicked, but he is still completely separate. We're not called to simply express our interest in the Lord. We're not called to be interested about how much do you think Jesus might embrace? How much do you think Jesus would let slide or might even get into with me if he was here? It's the wrong approach. Paul declares in Galatians 2, verse 19, that we've already read, I've been crucified with Christ. Now we're getting into the part of the verses that we remember. I've been crucified with Christ. Paul didn't say, I've decided that the life of Christ interests me, so I'm going to copy the interesting parts of it. Paul didn't say, I'm going to give my best effort to live according to these good ideas. Paul says, I've identified myself with Christ to the point that what I want is dead. And what he wants is what lives in me. Verse 20, I no longer live, but it's Christ who lives in me. I've identified with him to the point that my hopes and my dreams and my cravings and my desires to satisfy myself. The things that I once wanted desperately to define myself by or identify myself with, the way I wanted people to see me, all of that's gone. And if it's not, I'm going to kill it again and again and again and again. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. I'm taking everything that I once was, and I'm going to nail it to the cross again and again. Rather than letting it rise up in me, I'm going to nail it there and raise it up as a reminder of what Christ has done. You know, it was... This idea that we could just do what we wanted, that we could be interested in the good things of the Lord and continue to behave and live in the way that we want while just incorporating him, that has a point of origin. It happens in Genesis chapter 3. Satan convinced humanity in Genesis chapter 3 that we had some right to ourselves, that we had some right to do with our bodies what we pleased. That was Satan's idea. The Lord always said, I've created you and I gave you a purpose. You'll rule and reign over this and you will reflect me to these things and you will reflect me back to me. That's the purpose. Living within the boundaries of our physical bodies and our mental capacity is the greatest prison that has ever been constructed because Satan said, this is freedom to do whatever it is your mind and your body wants you to do. And the Lord says, I've got something bigger and more eternal and now you've confined yourself to your flesh. People that say, the things of Christ are interesting to me, but I'm going to hang out here with what I like. Oh, it's a prison. As a disciple of Christ, even though my body might look the same, my nature and the power that rules over me has radically changed. 1 Corinthians 2.16 tells us that those who are redeemed have the mind of Christ. That's freedom. That's liberty. I see and think and understand in the way that Christ does. I have his mind, not mine. Mine is a prison. His lasts forever. His is freedom and liberty. Mine dies and has nothing left of it. We're not bound by the cravings of our bodies and we're not able to be controlled by the fear of what will happen to this if we follow Christ. If this suffers or dies, it doesn't matter if I have the mind of Christ and I'm identified with him in his death. Any power that anyone holds over me with the idea of we'll kill you, so what? It's gone. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. Our spirit lives temporarily in this body, but it is not contained and it is not limited by it. If we will identify with Christ. This morning, if I can encourage you with something, As I'm coming to the end today, stop living as Satan's prisoner. 
just saying I'm interested in what Christ is doing. Stop trying to incorporate what pleases you into your Christian life. Stop trying to incorporate the most convenient and interesting pieces of this into the life that you want to live. The call of Christ. Oh, it's not just interesting. Looking at, as inter- looking at that as interesting is to just settle for being lawless, to settle for impurity and iniquity and slavery. This morning, I want to encourage you this. Answer the call of Christ to identify with him. Don't simply look at him with interest. Identify with him in his death and his resurrection. Follow after him completely into a freedom and a liberty that exists beyond what you can imagine. Mark 1.15. I'll close with this verse if you'll stand with me. Jesus gives the most simple invitation to salvation. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near to you. Repent and believe in the good news. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. And don't look upon him as something interesting. Identify yourself with him so that you have the strength to follow him. And so that you're no longer confined to the prison of your own idea of liberty this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you today for this message, hard as it might have been in sections. It's good to hear your word, and I'm glad that you love us enough to just be honest with us and tell us the truth. I pray this morning that we would remember the things that the Spirit has pointed out to us. I've watched it happen on the faces of people in the room this morning. And I have to trust that it's happening to those that are watching on the other side of a screen today. Lord, your spirit is moving on us to show us the places where we have just expressed interest, but we've not yet signed that death certificate. Lord, show us what we need to deny. Give us the strength to do it. Give us the courage to be identified with you, to live under the new covenant and the new law. Don't let us settle for something less than fully identifying with you and your example. Again, Lord, we love you. We're grateful that you'll be honest with us. I thank you for the chance to hear from you this morning. I pray that you'll keep us safe, that we'll leave here changed, and you'll give us opportunities to put into practice what you've presented us with today, and that the kingdom of God will be reflected well in our lives because we've gathered here to honor you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. I'll see you again soon.